In this third and last video on the history of American music, we'll look at the period from the 1950s through the present day, which of course really is the development of American rock and roll. By the 1950s, American music was exploding. The greatest impact of all the post-World War II trends, the amalgamation and evolution of musical forms, the electrification of instruments, the commercialization and growing popularity of music, and the rebellion of the young people of the age, all contributed to the rise of rock and roll. The spread of a rhythm and blues to the white youth of the 1950s lay the key foundation for what later was shortened to just rock music. But this music was itself hardly static, continuing to evolve into the present day. Traditional blues, gospel, jazz, and even folk and country and western have all influenced rock music over the years, so much so that as a single genre, rock's difficult to define. Perhaps the most important figure in initially launching rock and roll in the 1950s was a former truck driver from Mississippi, Elvis Presley. His music career began in 1954, first recorded by producer Sam Phillips at Memphis's Sun Records. Phillips wanted to bring black music to the growing white baby boomers. Presley had the looks and the voice, and with his small band quickly progressed from rockabilly, a brief mixture of country and rhythm and blues, into what radio DJ Alan Free, and you can see him on the bottom left, soon termed rock and roll. In time, Presley would be dubbed the king of rock and roll, or simply the king. Before his death in 1977 at his Memphis home, Graceland, Presley had become one of the top-selling solo artists of all time. Through his music and his rebellious, sexually suggestive style, he had helped introduce rock and roll to a generation of young people who would continue to see such music as a defining characteristic of their age. The rebellion implicit in rock and roll led to a number of both black and white stars in the 1950s. From uh, Fats Domino, Little Richard, and Chuck Berry, all the way to Bill Haley, Buddy Holly, and Jerry Lee Lewis, rock and roll exploded across radios. Many parents worried that such music was corrupting their children, their racial tones implicit. But it quickly became big business with AM D radio DJs having the power to make hits by rep repeatedly playing songs. Coin-operated jukeboxes that played single songs, 7-inch wide, 45 RPM records became popular diners in businesses that catered to young people. Rock and roll seemed fun and exciting, which made the sudden plane crash of three stars, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the big bopper J.P. Richardson in 1959 so shocking. People spoke of the day the music died, but in fact, rock and roll was still then in its infancy. The business side of the music had begun to make much of it formulaic, approximately three and a half minutes long songs for AM radio. But the genre was already getting ready to evolve again as the baby boomers continued to mature. By the dawn of the 1960s, a number of British young people enamored with rhythm and blues had already begun to emulate it. Groups such as the Beatles from Liverpool, of course, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr exploded onto the American music charts in 1962. Greeting them at the airport were thousands of screaming young people, and uh, the media soon spoke of Beatlemania sweeping the country. Lasting until 1970s, the Beatles ultimately had more influence on American rock music than any other band. They had more number one hits in America than any other band in history. Lennon and McCartney became iconic songwriters, their music growing and evolving to match the dynamic decade. It became more complex and innovative with influences from many musical forms, such as Indian music is only one example, and they always incorporated the, the latest technology. In short, the Beatles set the standard for rock bands. They were, however, not alone. Other British bands, such as the Rolling Stones in the top left here, with their lead singer Mick Jagger and The Who, and you can see them on the top right, became immensely popular with American youth and also influenced the direction of American rock. In fact, so many American bands toured America in 1964 that the media spoke of a British invasion. American musicians of note included Bob Dylan, born Robert Zimmerman Duluth, Dylan wrote a number of seminal rock songs that incorporated folk traditions of protest. In fact, Dylan's creative lyrics later won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Dylan, you know, like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, remained inventive in his 
Dylan's music, melding different musical forms into his rock music. In fact, when Dylan first went electric, his folk fans booed him. There were a proliferation of very talented American musical groups in the 1960s, such as the Beach Boys, you can see them above, who sang of California and surfing their lyrics. But, like many bands, later expanded the complexity of their music as the decade passed. Like the Beatles, American rock musicians were at the forefront in the sex, drugs, and rock and roll that came to define the counterculture of the late 1960s. The Grateful Dead, centered in the counterculture capital of the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco with their lead singer Jerry Garcia, became best known for the sort of psychedelic music often associated with the decade. By the late 1960s, British groups like Led Zeppelin on the left had helped inspire a harder, guitar-centric, heavier metal sound. American guitarists such as Jimi Hendrix, you can see him on the right, became famous for his exceptional heavy guitar sound. Guitarist Carlos Santana incorporated Latin musical traditions in his heavier guitar sound, once again expanding what rock music meant. The Doors combined the moody and haunting poetry of lead singer Jim Morrison, and you can see him on the far right on the picture on the right, with a heavy blues influence in their harder rock. Morrison became the prototypical band frontman, his commanding voice matching his lyrics. One so-called, quote, supergroup was Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, who crossed genres. Their shows at time electric and other times acoustic. In fact, they were best known for their harmonies. Each member had their own impressive solo career, most notably Neil Young, and you can see him on the picture on the left and the far left, and on the picture on the right and the far right. In addition to the heavy guitar-centric rock, the 1960s still saw an amazing proliferation of talented singer-songwriters, including, here clockwise from top left, James Taylor, the duo Simon and Garfunkel, and Simon there played the, uh, went over, or rather went on to a, an impressive solo career. Jackson Brown, who was known for his rock ballads, and the pianist Carol King, among many others. By the uh, 1960s, people listened to music in eight tracks in cassette players. Cars would have eight track players and then cassette players. The youthful rock music of the 1960s fit in well with FM radio. FM radio was first created in the 1930s, but by 1961, FM was broadcasting in stereo and record companies developed it as sort of an alternative rock formula. It centered more on albums, longer songs, and less on the formulatic, you know, three and a half minute pop hits that were common on AM radio. Of course, the most famous event in the 1960s counterculture music scene was the Woodstock Festival from August 15th to August 17th, 1969. Build is a three days of peace and music held at Max Yazger's 600-acre dairy farm in the Catskills in New York. The concert had 32 acts performing outdoors, but word spread so much that it grew out of control and ended up with uh, well over 400,000 people showing up, and so it kind of became a, a free concert. The rain came, and uh, you know, but it, it didn't do much to dampen the spirits. Even as the crowds shut down the New York State Thruway, and organizers had to rush to get in the necessary supplies for all the masses. The music went on. You have, uh, amazingly, th there were no no discernible violence. And, and Woodstock remains today emblematic of sort of the, the, the peak of the hippie peace counterculture. The magazine Rolling Stone covered all the music scene, at first more rebellious and edgy, but like the music industry itself, later growing more profitable as a big business and thus less counterculture. By the 1970s, with more money in the music business, music had become less political or protest or related, while rock music continued to diversify into new sort of sub-genres. Some groups, such as Pink Floyd, employed still new instruments and recorded sounds adding to their music, while others like the Moody Boos even employed orchestras. The group The Who created several themed albums they called rock operas. There was the growth of southern rock with southern bands and southern lyrics and incorporating southern musical traditions into rock. 
African Americans continued to expand the Motown sound during the 1970s, most notably with musicians such as Stevie Wonder, you can see him on the left, and the group of brothers known as the Jackson Five, featuring a young Michael Jackson who later would go into greater fame as a solo artist, and you can see them on the right. In the 1970s, a new African American genre grew known as funk music, a more upbeat, danceable version of soul music in many ways. It had bands like Sly and the Family Stone and Cool and the Gang. Of course, one of the most famous genres of the 1970s decade was the growth of disco music, and it's sort of a, a fast-paced dance music. Disco was popularized by the group the Bee Gees, you can see them on the right ear, and in the movie Saturday Night Fever starring John Travolta, and you can see that on the left. Disco dance bars with their light show and the fa fancy light ball on the, off the ceiling you know, were popular in many in many towns. One of the most famous party spots in the 1970s was New York's Studio 54, and you can see it on the right, big disco uh, scene. In the late 1970s, Sony Corporation marketed one of the first mobile cassette players, the Walkman. People could now listen to their own music on the go, which was pretty, pretty revolutionary. And of course, by the 1980s, American music continued to develop. With new digital recording, music often incorporated more synthesizers and electronic sounds, eventually forming what people called techno music or even Eurodance music, often in bars with light shows. Singer-songwriters declined, but a new form of rock, more raw and angry, was punk music. Less melodic and more confrontational, punk music was in a way a return to rock's rebellious origins. It was clearly a reaction against both the spread of disco music and the manufactured pop music of big business. Arena-filling heavy metal bands, often with elaborate outfits and big hair, were popular with the many white youth in the 1980s. Some were so elaborate people spoke of glam rock. Out of the urban African American community came the growth of hip-hop culture, which included rap music. Rap embraced the creation of rhythm via vocal percussion, utilizing a form of beating rhythmic poetry about the African-American experience. Hip-hop combined so-called beatboxing, using the sounds of the mouth, lips, tongue, and voice with rhythmic body motion such as breakdancing. Popular among hip-hop enthusiasts in the 1980s were large stereo players that would be carried in blast music, the so-called boom boxes. In time, the use of sounds from scratching vinyl records for unique sounds. You know, DJing, they called it, also contributed. Hip-hop exploded in the 1980s, while rap music continues to popular in popularity to the present. Over the years since the 1980s, both have influenced musicians and in other musical genres. Music in the 1980s was also influenced by the spread of cable television, which included MTV, or music television. MTV focused on music videos as much as radio did songs. Musicians now combine their songs with visual imagery. In any event, there were a number of pop stars throughout the 1980s. Probably the greatest stars of the decade were, and you can see them clockwise from the top left, Michael Jackson, Prince, Bruce Springsteen, and Madonna, who collectively dominated the charts. Music during the 1990s remained eclectic, but still dominated by pop music with groups such as the Spice Girls, and you can see them uh, below on the left, and hip-hop, uh, that, that continued to prosper. Perhaps as a reaction to pop music, grunge music and style also proliferated, most notably with Nirvana and its lead singer, Kurt Cobain. Centered in Seattle and Pacific Northwest, grunge combined elements of guitar-centric punk and heavy metal, and was characterized by casual, comfortable dress. And you can see Nirvana on the bottom right. During the 1990s, raves were popular, essentially large dance parties with a DJ or live music playing electronic dance music, often accompanied by lights and other special effects. Obviously, this has roots all the way back into uh, you know, the disco light shows and electronic music earlier. Grunge was an early form of what people in the 1990s began to term alternative rock. While bands such as Nirvana certainly became famous, alt-rock musicians tended to stick with smaller independent labels, which arguably provided them more creativity and control over their music. Anti-commercial and anti-standardized, it was more concerned with creativity and quality than pop success and money. 
By the 1990s, rock music had become so popular and diverse for so long that a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame had opened in Cleveland to document its history and its stars. In the early 2000s, the Apple Corporation changed everything when it released its first iPod in 2001. People could download to their computer music CDs they had purchased and then for the first time transfer that digital music to a small digital player easily attached to an article of clothing or placed in a pocket. The iPod could hold hundreds of songs and it was revolutionary, promising to change the way people listen to music. Apple then opened its iTunes store in 2003, having negotiated deals with major record labels. For the first time, people could purchase downloaded music directly online. It was available first only on Apple's Macintosh, but later quickly expanded to Windows. But it only took a few years for technology to move past the Apple Store. New businesses such as Spotify allowed people access to virtually all music through the cloud for a monthly subscription. No longer did people have to pay a single charge for a single song. New algorithms analyzed what people listened to and suggested similar songs they might enjoy. Today, mu American music remains popular worldwide, an aspect of its culture that continues to define the nation. This concludes the third and final video on the history of American music.